Fireball XL5 first aired in 1962 and was the second series to carry the words filmed in Super Mario Nation. Okay, Venus. Okay, Steve. Right. Let's go! Set 100 years into the future, the series would continue to develop the traditional Anderson formats and tropes that had begun with Supercar. That's right. Across 39 action-packed episodes, the heroic Colonel Steve Zodiac of the World Space Patrol took the controls of Fireball XL5, one of a fleet of XL rocket ships based at Space City. Don't you think you should take the Professor and Venus on this mission? Steve's crew consisted of the scientific genius Professor Matthew Matic, Help! the beautiful doctor of space medicine, Venus, I gather by the compliments, Steve, you want something to eat and robotic co-pilot Robert. Oh, no way In charge of Space City itself was the lovably cantankerous Commander Zero. This is World Space Patrol Headquarters, not a circus! With his eager assistant, Lieutenant 90, often finding himself used as a sounding board for Zero's frustrations. But sir, there you go again! While Scottish Chief Engineer Jock Campbell was responsible for keeping the XL fleet running smoothly. Leave it to me. Also along for the ride, usually causing trouble wherever he went, was Venus's pet lazoon, Zuni. Howdy, folks! Tasked with keeping the peace in Sector 25 while also occasionally going where no man had gone before, the Fireball XL5 crew regularly faced such villains as the subterranes of Planet 46, The vengeance of the subterranes has begun! and Boris and Griselda, a.k.a. Mr. and Mrs. Space Spy. Steve Zodiac is coming! Zodiac! Other memorable horrors lurking out in space included granitoid tanks, plant men, space monsters, and further terrors both large and small. <laughs> the heroic tones of Steve Zodiac were provided by actor Paul Maxwell, who would later be heard and seen in other Anderson productions. I can't let that call go unanswered. David Graham returned once again, this time playing Professor Matic, Lieutenant 90, and Zuni. Hmm. I'm glad about that. While John Bluthall, in his only association with any Anderson production, provided the voices of Commander Zero and Jock. Is that an order, Commander? No, Jock, just a suggestion. Sylvia Anderson was to take the roles of Venus, Commander Zero's wife Eleanor, and their son Jonathan. I wish Mom hadn't gone away. Yeah, you can say that again. While Jerry Anderson himself voiced Robert the Robot and all the show's other robots using an artificial larynx. Robots of the jury, how do you find the prisoners? Uh... Fireball XL5 saw the AP Films team drastically expand the scope of their storytelling, from the contemporary everyday world of supercar to the almost limitless possibilities of outer space. Wonderful sight! and the production team rose to the challenge expertly. The puppet department were now producing human characters that were slightly easier on the eye than some of those seen in Supercar. Well, most of the time, anyway. Ah, uh, shut up. Yeah, shut up. While the show's sci-fi setting also allowed them the chance to create a varied mix of strange alien life forms. What do you say to that? People. On the model front, we moved from the lone desert laboratory of Black Rock and only occasional guest vehicle of Supercar to the bustling and futuristic Space City, plus a whole universe full of exciting new vehicles. The Fireball XL5 launch sequence, which opened every single episode, proved to be one of the most memorable parts of the show. Even if the series never did answer the question on every young fan's mind, who has to go and rescue that trolley after every launch? Ugh, oh, this is getting monotonous. Fireball XL5 began airing just as the space race was beginning to heat up, and found favour with an audience whose imaginations had been fired by the seemingly very real possibility that mankind could be living on the moon in just a few short years. Well, it's no use daydreaming about it, lad. We've got work to do. The AP Films team embraced that expectation and ran with it, to the extent that human beings in Fireball XL5 are perfectly able to survive and even speak in the vacuum of space, provided they've remembered to take their oxygen pills before stepping out. Take this. It's an oxygen pill. It'll enable you to live in space. Fireball XL5 ran for just one season, 
and several of the final episodes to be produced featured the on-screen destruction of its star vehicle and major location models. I'm afraid it couldn't be saved, Venus. I'm sorry. It seemed that the AP Films team were anxious to be finished with the series and on to the next project. Oh, what do you know about that? However, eagle-eyed viewers of the next Anderson series, Stingray, might just spot Commander Zero, while Steve Zodiac himself played the self-absorbed movie star Johnny Swoonara in the episode Stand By For Action. I don't have to put up with this. It's not in my contract! Despite the often questionable science, and some even more questionable sexism, They may have electronic dishwashers, but women? They haven't changed one bit since the 1960s. The success of Fireball XL5 helped to cement the reputation of AP Films as a production company that was going places, culminating in Lou Grade's eventual purchase of the company from the Andersons. Millions and millions of dollars for us! The show also holds the unique distinction of being the only Anderson series to be networked in the United States. It can only mean one thing. While his other shows aired in syndication despite all efforts to get a network deal, Fireball XL5 aired in NBC's Saturday morning schedules from 1963 to 1965. And if you can arrange for the Earth to be invaded while we're on the air, we'd sure appreciate it. By this time, Fireball XL5 was already a lucrative merchandising success, with a variety of books, toys and games based on the series still highly sought after even today. Your Fireball is very impressive. And Don Spencer's classic end title song proving to be one of the most enduring elements of the show. It sure is a cool number. When the classic TV Century 21 comic was first published in 1965, Fireball XL5 fans had new weekly adventures to enjoy, with the show's characters now able to do things their puppet counterparts would never be able to achieve, and this time in full colour. Sadly, the fact that Fireball XL5 the television series was produced in black and white is almost certainly the reason it hasn't enjoyed as much repeat exposure over the years as the colour series that came after it. Yeah, no, 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 Robert, it's no need to get all steamed up. While its characters can seem more than a little dim at times, even for a children's show, we're making no progress at all. And their would-be trendy dialogue makes them sound more like inhabitants of the 1950s than the 2060s. Gee, I'm sorry, I'm a tootie. Real force, Venus. The show still has all the same elements of action and excitement that made the likes of Stingray and Thunderbirds so successful. I think the programs are of an amazingly high standard. And it still has the the ability to entertain a child audience if they can get to see it. More importantly, Fireball XL5 established a successful format that many subsequent series would develop still further, with almost weekly alien threats to Earth being repelled by operatives of a world security organization and their amazing vehicles. I guess I know now why they call you the greatest astronaut on Space Patrol. I think you're cute too. Fireball XL5 may at times seem like a forgotten series, but its legacy would cast a long shadow over the next decade of Jerry Anderson's output. Uh -huh.